the past few weeks, you guys know we've been we've been studying the purple book, right? We've been looking at the purple book. We're going to put a picture up of that just in case you guys don't know what that is. But we've been studying the purple book and trying to learn how to be disciples so we can be better at discipling others. That's really the bottom line of what it, what it is. And so last week, Pastor Elvin pro, talk, spoke on being a disciple and a leadership, a, a leader and what that looks like. That's what he spoke about last week. So there are a couple of things that I just kind of wanted to bullet point on what he taught about last week. Because he spoke about discipleship and leadership. And what the word was is that we must deny ourselves... Carry our crosses how often? Daily. Daily. Yes, and follow Jesus. So he said there's a cost, a calling, and a cross that we all must carry. Now, when we carry that cross, what happens is we get stronger. We grow in the Lord. We grow in who God called us to be and the things that he called us to do in this world. So now you may be asking, okay, Sabrina, now that we're doing what we're supposed to do, we're carrying our cross and we're getting stronger, now what does that look like? Now that I have all of this strength, what do I do? Do I just now, now I'm strong on this island all alone by myself and I'm just, I'm strong in the Lord by myself. Is that what he called us to do and what he called us to be? <laughs> Absolutely not. So what I wanna do today is I wanna share something with you Got a couple of pictures that I want to show you. So this first picture that I want to show you is a picture of a Belgian horse. It's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. This, this horse is the strongest breed of all the horses out there. Okay? This horse, even though it's only, it's 2,000 pounds, can pull up to 4,000 pounds. Okay, so pretty strong in and of itself, right? right? To pull double its weight. Now, if we were to put two Belgian horses together, how many pounds do you guys think it could pull? I hear eight. That is not correct. <laughs> two of these horses together can pull 16,000 pounds together. Okay, you guys kind of see where I'm going here. When we're trying to do stuff by ourselves, we can do a bunch, but if we can do it with somebody else, it causes multiplication to happen. Yes. That's, not the, that's not even what I wanted to share with you. The next thing, if we were to take these two horses and let them live together, let them walk together, run together, eat together, and do horse life together. <laughs> now, what they can pull is now up to 32,000 pounds. So, what we're looking at is, when we do life together, multiplication upon multiplication happens. Huge, huge. One more thing I want to share with you. There's a record of two Belgian horses that were brothers that grew up together. They were raised together. They did everything together since they were born. The record on what they pulled was 52,000 pounds. Wow. 52,000 pounds is what they pulled. From 16,000 all the way to 52,000 pounds just because they did life together. Today what I want to talk to you about is that we all must unify to multiply. That's what the message is going to be about today. Amen? Amen. Now, even though this is just a natural example of just horses, Romans 1 and 20 says that we can gain insight into God's character and his power through natural things that happen here on the earth. So, again, yes, these are just horses. But think about it like this. If we who are created in God's own image, were to live together, 
walk together, run together, eat together in unity and trust each other, nothing is impossible. Amen. Nothing. How much multiplication could happen and be accomplished if we were to do things together? If we were to live in unity, how much multiplication could and would God do? So that's what we're going to talk about today. In the purple book, you guys, if you're, if you're joining with us, you know that we are looking at Acts 2, 42 through 47. This is when the church was first built. Now, before we go and looking at that scripture, I want to share, give you a little bit of background on what's happening there. Right after God poured, poured out his Holy Spirit among the people um, that were there, Peter preached a word. And he talked to because what happened was when the Holy Spirit was poured out, people were confused. They didn't know what to do. They're like, we've never had this before. How do we act? How do we respond? What do we do? So Peter stood up and he preached his first sermon. He preached a sermon and he told them what they needed to do, what it all meant. He told them that they needed to repent Turn away from their sins, turn to God, and be baptized. Yep, yep. And, and it so touched their hearts that 3,000 people gave their lives to the Lord. Yep. 3,000 people gave their lives to the Lord. And so this is where we're going to pick up. Once they received the Holy Spirit and they gave their lives to the Lord. Let's see what happened. So now we're going to go into Acts 2, 42 through 47. And let's just read. It's a little bit of scripture, but, but you guys will see where I'm going here. All of the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing of meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miracles, signs, and wonders. And all of the believers met together in one place and shared everything that they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. All the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of the Lord. Woo! The first church, right? That was absolutely the first church. What happened here? There were four things that happened. What were they? Number one, there, they got underneath some biblical teaching. That's number one. Number two, there was fellowship. Number three, there was breaking of bread. And number four, prayer and worship. They became a church. But think about it like this, too, because... Peter didn't tell them these four things to do. He said, repent, be baptized. That's all he told them to do. So the prompting of the Holy Spirit is what allowed them to do those things. They just did it with joy. They were excited to do it because the Holy Spirit spoke to each one of them. And they just, it was a natural thing to do. When God moved. <laughs> it, it, it's amazing when the Holy Spirit moves what, what ends up happening and what, what things are prompted if we act upon it. <laughs> so the thing is, when I look at these four things, we have to look at them all together. Because a lot of times we're looking and what we do is we mess up as a church is we'll do one of the two or two of them or two of them. We don't do all four of them together. But I tell you, all four of them is what makes a healthy church. That's what I think what happens is we try, we take, do our best effort, but sometimes we don't do the whole, all four of them. And, and it, it kind of messes us up a little bit. But I guess the, what I'm saying is the most important part is that we have all four of these elements in our churches today in order to be effective, in order to be what God called us to be. So we're literally going to go through all four of them, and I'm going to show you how 
when you do that one thing in isolation, how you, you're a little off in, in what you're doing and how you're, you're not doing what God called you to do. So number one, what did he say? Biblical teaching. Yep. Everybody say biblical teaching. Biblical teaching. It's so important that we have sound biblical teaching. Right. This is our foundation. This is who we are. How are we supposed to be Christians when we don't know what God has to say? We don't. We have no idea where to go. I mean, these are God's truth. They help us experience spiritual growth and to make a kingdom impact. But the thing is, when we just, okay, Lord, I'm, I'm going to kind of learn your Bible and that's all I'm going to do. What happens is it becomes just a ritual. I'm just learning, but that's it. You have the information, you have the facts and the details, but no knowledge, no application of that thing. That's what ends up happening. If you know God's word, you are held accountable for that word. You got to apply it. That's what he called us to do and what he called us to be. Amen. Amen. Number two, fellowship. We like this one. We want to get together and we want to have fun. We want to have fellowship. We want to share our lives together and do those things. I like this because it says they had everything in common. And I'm going to tell you, when you share your life with someone as they did, you don't have any problem giving when there's somebody that's in need. You get to know that person. You get to know their heart. You have no problem. Our problem is we don't know people. They need stuff and we just judge them because we don't know who they are because we've never done life with them. So that's why it's so important, you know, and, and you got to be balanced with it because, you know, fellowship is great in, in the midst of Christians, but it has to be on purpose for a reason. You, you can just hang out with somebody and have no real connection. I, I can go hang out at the club I'm fellowshipping. Yeah. Is that what I'm doing? No, not really. So that's why it's important to have all the other aspects of it, too. Yeah. Number three, breaking of bread. Oh, this is my favorite. I love to eat. <laughs> really? Right? Sharing meals creates a bond. It creates a bond because it encourages face-to-face -face conversation. So, so typically what happens, what we're texting somebody, we're sending them an email. We're so impersonal nowadays, right? But when you sit down with somebody and you enjoy a meal, go, oh, girl, that brisket was good. You are connecting on that way face to face with somebody. So it's an important part. You know, God said it's okay. To, it's okay to break bread together. It's okay to eat together. It creates that bond um, and, and just communication, which is so important, which we're lacking so much nowadays. And then I guess without balance, without everything else, it, it's just like going to a restaurant. I can literally go to a restaurant and sit next to somebody that I don't know, and there's nothing there. There's no connection. There's nothing God doesn't get the glory in that. Finally, prayer and worship. This is our communication to God. When we pray, when we worship, we're communicating to him, which helps our relationship with him to grow and helps our relationship grow with others because we are communicating. And guess what? He communicates back. Oh, and so just know that when we're doing that, that's what we're doing. But without balance... You know what? I'm going in my prayer closet. I'm going to close the door and I don't need anybody else. Eesh. You can isolate yourself. When you isolate yourself, you are no earthly good. Because it's all about you. I'm here to tell you today, it ain't about you. This walk is not about you. Now there's some blessings that come, but ultimately it's not about you. It's about him. And so we have to remember that these four activities are not only foundational in the church body, but also in our personal lives. If you saw what it said, it, it said they met in the temple and, and into their, in their homes. So they did all four of these things at church and also at home. Yes. So when you go home, 
this isn't something that you just take it off. Okay, I, I did my church thing today. I did my Christian thing today. I went to church. I worshiped. I raised my hand. Then I go home and I listen to whatever I want to listen to. I'm not focused on God. I'm not focused on, on fellowship. I'm not focused on breaking of bread. These people did this at home. It was a lifestyle. This is who I am. I'm not pretending to be this on Sunday mornings. This is who I am. This is my foundation. This is my core. Because I'm going to tell you, it says that they had joy. They, they, they had awe. They had all of these things. But, and the reason why is because it started at home. So when they came together and they saw, oh, you prayed about this and God answered this and God's doing this and God is speaking this. They came together in unity and there was joy in that because they brought it in the house with them. That's where it comes from. You got to bring it in. A pastor shouldn't have to stand up here and say, okay, guys, get excited. Let's get excited about this. No, you, we have to bring it with us. And, and I'm going to say, I'm guilty sometimes, too. I'm, you know, gosh, so much happened this week. Oh, I just need you just to move and just, I'm just going to sit here. You pour into me. No, we got to push through that. We got to lift our hands. We got to praise. We got to worship because that's when he moves. That's when he changes things and changes circumstances in our lives. So it's important that it's not only here, but it's at home. You got to do these things at home. Yeah, yeah. It, it, as it says, it caused them to have awe and gladness. I'm just reading the, 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 what it says. Sincere heart. They had joy. They had favor. What? Yeah. They had favor. You want some favor in your life? You need to do some of these things, or all of them, shall I say. Biblical teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, prayer and worship. You're going to get some favor coming to you. Amen? Yeah. Amen? Amen. <laughs> and so what I want to do is I want to also show you what happened as a result of their unity, as a result of those four things that they did. Let's see the result of that. Acts 2, 4, uh, 2, 43b, the second part. The apostles performed many miracles, miraculous signs and wonders. Huh. Because of unity. What? So miracles happen because they were unified. Did you know that? Have you ever asked yourself, you know what? Back in those biblical days, they sure had a bunch of miracles. They sure had a bunch of signs. Why don't we see those nowadays? Now, I'm not going to say never, but why don't we see them as much? Hope you guys still believe in miracles. Yes? Yes? Why don't we see those, these miracles as much as they did? Maybe it's because we're not unified. Maybe because we're not together like we should be, which causes him to move and change some things and miracles to happen. Makes you think about it, right? But that's what it says. They were unified. The results, miracles, signs, and wonders. They were, they were all performed there. So, let's see. What else happened? Acts 2, 47, part B. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. What? From unity. People got saved? Who would have thought? Who would have thought? So God responded to their unity by adding numbers, adding people to their fellowship daily. So there was a new person being saved every single day because they had unity and they unified themselves as a family. He moved. Think about it. If we are behaving like the Christians that we are called to be, he adds to those that are being saved. What? We want to make it difficult. What do we want to do? We're going to, oh, we got to go. We got to go knock on some doors. We got to go on the corner and hold a sign. Jesus saves. This said because of who they were just acting like the church, God brought them to people. He did the hard work. We, we, we don't have to do it because he's going to take care of it. 
God, the thing is, when we do our part, God does his part. That's where the true multiplication happens, guys. That's where multiplication happens because he does that. And he'll draw them to us. All we just got to be is who he called us to be as Christians. Amen? Amen. 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 And did you know also that there is power in unity? Yes. Yes. What? Wherever two or more are gathered, he is in the midst. And he's not just standing there doing nothing. He's moving. Let's take a look at Matthew 16 and 18. It says, now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church. And all of the powers of hell will not conquer it. Amen. Amen. So what does this say? There's some powers that are against us. There are. And you try to do that thing in and of yourself, ish. Can you conquer it? Maybe sometimes. But if we stand together, we're going to be able to conquer those things. We got to be built up. We got to be unified. And then we will conquer what's trying to come against us. Now, I wanted to share this because I, I, my husband and I met with a pastor. He was in the kind of political realm. But he shared this with us. And I just thought it was the most interesting thing. Did you know that many of the anti-Christian agendas that are out there right now that we are dealing with are as a result, they're a result of us as Christians not being united? Because literally this gentleman said, you know what, when we went to the board and when we were talking to these people, you guys as Christians weren't standing up for what, everybody wasn't standing up. So on the other side, we were, and so that's how our agenda got, got passed. Because we stood together and you guys didn't. That is the truth. But because the thing is, what we do is we make the mistake of saying, oh, I'm just one person. I can't make a difference. My choice doesn't matter. My vote doesn't make a difference. Your vote does make a difference. It does. Think about it like this. Don't think of it as your one little vote. Think of it as I'm that other horse coming along with somebody else that's a Christian so that God can exponentially move. There you go. There you because go. your vote, your yes, along with somebody else, Jesus can do so many things. God can do so many miracles with that. But you got to stand up and vote and say and stand up for what you believe in because that's when he exponentially moves. Amen. So when we don't, oh, oh, let me say this. The enemy wants you to believe that. The enemy wants you to believe, Psh, it don't matter. You don't have to vote because it don't matter anyway because he knows us as Christians, when we come together in unity, his agenda has no say. His agenda has no power that it's going to be overturned. He knows that. So he wants you to believe that it doesn't matter when you stand up for what you believe in. Yeah. Guys, when, when you don't vote, it's a divide in unity. It is definitely a divide in unity and <laughs> You, you just don't understand what you're doing when you don't vote. It's huge. You have to vote. We as Christians, imagine, imagine if we as Christians voted and stood together and stood unified and allowed God to multiply. How much change could happen in this world? How much change could happen? When you see now, you're not going to see that stuff anymore because he's going to move it. He's going to change it. He's going to multiply it. Your one vote is your yes and amen to what he's going to do.